the plant walk here today at the GVI Gardens. Uh, my name is Scott Baker. I will be your guide on this lovely tour. Uh, I'm working today with two coyotes and Catherine here. Hello. Uh, I am the farm manager here at Reservoir Community Farm, uh, one of uh, Green Village Initiative's community gardens and uh, the farm where we grow produce for our farm stand. Today we'll be talking about all of the wonderful, amazing wild edible plants that are right here, right now, right under our feet. Uh, that can be food, can be medicine, uh, and that are just as useful as cultivated plants, uh, though not cultivated. But first, I want to talk a bit about safety, because if you are eating wild plants, it's a little different game than cultivated plants. Like cultivated plants, you eat the ones that are in the garden bed, you're fine, you planted them, you know what they are, it's great. Wild plants, not necessarily. Uh, there are poisonous plants, there are plants that can make you physically sick, that can make you weird in the head, uh, that can kill you. So you need to know what you're going to harvest. Uh, there are thankfully not very many plants that are poisonous to the degree that they are going to kill you. I recommend personally, it's up to you, I recommend learning the most poisonous plants in Connecticut first. Learn really well what poison ivy looks like, what false hellebore looks like, what doll's eye looks like. Uh, they aren't common. They would probably have no chance of ever growing in an environment like this. And just just have them in your head. Just, just know what plants you really, really can't eat. Because if you're dead, you can't forage more plants. And that, that, that's no fun. Uh, there are poisonous lookalikes for some of the plants we'll talk about today, and I'll talk about those as we go through them. Uh, some of them look very similar, some of them don't look that similar. Uh, those plants you'll really want to be careful to make sure that you have the right plant before you eat it, uh, or before you use it. I'll be talking about stuff today. I will also have uh, a bit more info for you in slide format when we talk later at the live Q&A session for this video. But if you don't have me to talk to, ask Google. There's an amazing number of plant resources online, uh, and not all of them are 100% reliable. So check a few websites. Look through the top results on Google. Uh, check, make, check the website, website's credibility itself. Is it a private person or is it an institution? Uh, there is so much information out there, and all of it's put out well-meaningly, but that doesn't all mean it's correct. So do your research and make sure you know the plant 100%. Make sure you know the plant 99.9999999% before you harvest it, before you ingest it. Because you don't want to get sick. It's not a fun time. We have mint. You may probably already know it. There are so many different species and it is incredibly prolific. It's a plant that once you plant it will send roots and runners under the ground and explode out everywhere. Uh, this is a type of mint. I don't actually know what species of mint this is and I do still know it's a mint. There are plants that you want to identify them by the individual species, like all the plants that we've talked about before, and there are some plants that you can just identify them by the family, so the larger type of plant that they are. I know that this is in the family of mints, and all of the plants in the mint family are edible, so I know that this plant is edible. The way I know that it's in the mint family is, like I said on cleavers, it has a square stem in cross-section. So if you look at it, it has four distinct sides that are all pair that are... the pairs are parallel and form a square in cross-section. Uh, the leaves, however, do not come out in a whirl like cleavers. They come out directly opposite each other. So each leaf where the stem, or technical term, the petiole, meets uh, 
or where each leaf's stem meets the stalk will be directly opposite one another. Here, and here, and here, all the way up the plant. Mints you can eat the leaves of. They taste like mint. They are not so much a food stuff because they do taste very strong, but they can be used as a cooking spice in anything that you want to taste like mint. It will taste a lot like mint because mint is a strong taste. And it can also be used to make a tea, either fresh or uh, dried and then made into powdered and made into tea. The tea of mint is very calming to stomachs uh, and it, for any uh, problem where you have nausea or uh, stomach upset for any reason, it will often help calm and relax your stomach. I like to sometimes just put fresh mint leaves in uh, water or lemonade for a little bit of an infusion, which has a similarly strong minty flavor. Um, it's also really good with lentils and cumin. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, I want to try that. That sounds good. <laughs> I would highly recommend it. Um, yeah, mint is a big spreader. You can, all of this over here is mint, and you can see it started in this uh, community garden bed, in this raised bed, and then it continued growing out uh, along the whole side here. So it's good that it's so tasty. Mint also consistently has flowers that will form on stalks. Okay. And I don't know if this is true for all mints, but the vast majority of mints I have found in Connecticut will have their flowers occurring in something like this. A lot of flowers coming off a single stem. Do you know what species of mint this is, Kathy? I do not, um, but I do see this flower over here that has some more of the petals still on it, um, which might be fun to look at. It has these sort of purple flowers. That's mint. again from the exact same spot. Our next plant is Smartweed. It is also known as Lady's Thumb as well as a bunch of other names. This is one of those plants that if you look it up online you'll find at least a dozen different common names for it. I know it as Smartweed. You might not. I was just noticing that it has the really really pretty pink flowers and Scott told me that they're not flowers they're all actually And if you look at them closely, they are, in fact, little hard seeds. Uh, the flowers of Lady's Thumb are also pink, uh, sometimes white. But at this stage, once they have gone to seed, the seeds make a tasty, tasty food. Uh, they are actually in the amaranth family, and these are technically a grain. You can make flour out of them if you really want to go to that all that effort. I don't. I don't make them into flour normally. I just eat them as is. They have a slightly bitter flavor. Uh, they also sometimes have a slightly sweet flavor. They are a plant that depending on where it grows the flavor varies a lot. So you may need to pick around and find a patch that has a flavor you enjoy. Because some patches are sweet and delicious and almost taste like raspberries and some are super bitter and astringent and I, I, I don't like them, so I don't eat them. Again, food should be something that not only is nourishing for you, but also is an enjoyable experience to eat. I identify these by the seed stalks when they are in bloom this time of year. The rest of the year, they are a little bit trickier to identify. They have pretty generic leaf-shaped leaves. <laughs> What they is the technical edges. term for a, an oval kind of leaf like that with a point? Leaf shaped. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> there is a technical term for it. I'm blanking out right now. Yeah, for our purposes, I think leaf shaped works great. Yes. Uh, they have edges that don't have any teeth on them. They're completely smooth or in technical terms, entire. 
Uh, the stem is lightly red, sometimes even like a yellowish red. And the leaves do have a stem leading to the stalk, but it's very short and will almost sometimes look like they are coming directly off the stalk. Uh, this is a plant that, if you pointed it out to me at a time of year when the flowers haven't gone to seed, I might have a hard time telling what it is. Some plants are very distinctive at certain times of year, and the rest of the year might not look like much. Uh, some plants vary when you want to harvest them. If I just walked up to you and told you, hey, you can eat smartweed, you might go to up to it in the springtime and try and eat the leaves, which would be bitter and weird and gross. When you harvest plants, you want to know not only that the plant is edible, you want to know what part of the plant is edible and when. Mints. It's leaves. You can harvest it any time of the year at all. Smartweed. You can eat the seeds, but only when the seeds are there. Uh, wild carrot. You can harvest the root any time of year, but it's going to be sweeter and tastier in the fall, winter, and spring. In the summertime, it'll be very small and not have a lot of flavor. So knowing what part of the plant uh, and when to harvest the plant is just as important as knowing what plant to harvest. That's Smartweed. Next plant. You might remember I mentioned plantain in the last clip. Plantain, more officially known as broadleaf plantain, completely unrelated to the banana looking thing from very far south here. Uh, this plant is originally from Europe. Uh, it came over to America originally with uh, the colonists and took over. There was a point where it was called white man's footprint because it spread at roughly the same rate as settlers from Europe across America. Uh, this plant is edible. It's kind of bitter and has very wide, very stringy leaves that uh, have very distinct veins. Flipping it to the underside, the veins are very noticeably raised above the leaf itself. Like dandelion, it also has this reddish purple tinge down towards the base of the leaf. And very distinctly, the stalk of the leaf also, if you try and pull it apart, has these long stringy fibers, which, in case you couldn't guess, that's not necessarily the greatest thing to eat. Plantain leaf of this size, not my first choice for eating. I would look for a plant much smaller than this, or even an individual near it that just has smaller leaves. And these are going to be much more tender, much more not bitter, and are going to be much more pleasant food stuff. Do you eat these raw or cooked usually? I usually have them raw as in salad. Mm -hmm. You can totally cook them too. You can use them like any cultivated green. Uh, in, in addition, they can also be used medicinally. They are a vulnerary, 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 vulnerary. I like that. Great word. Not not what used does it to mean? say. It means that it makes your skin happy. Hmm. So if you have any kind of minor injury on your skin, a small cut. Uh, bee sting, they're very useful against small burn, bruise, you can crush up the leaf, even sometimes if you chew it lightly in your back teeth and make it what's called a spit poultice, just a lightly crushed plant in your mouth, and apply it to any kind of small wound, it will increase the healing rate and will decrease the amount of pain. The seeds are also edible. However, they are mostly just fiber, but I will sometimes nibble on them if they happen to be around. And you probably already know this plant from the very well-known product, Metamucil. 
these seeds are what's used to make Metamucil. They are incredibly high in fiber and are just turned into powder and it creates a very efficient laxative because it is too much fiber for your body to easily process and then gets flushed out. So maybe don't eat too many of those at once. I had never uh, known what this plant was, but I, I see it everywhere. Uh, like you're talking, it's an invasive species in the area, certainly. But I do have a lot of experience playing with those seed pods, sort of uh, peeling them off. It's very entertaining if you're in a field of grassy weeds. So this plant is broadleaf plantain. Much more common of the two plantain species. However, you will see around narrow leaf plantain. It is a very closely related species, has all the same properties food-wise, medicine-wise. However, the leaves are very long and thin. They are lanceolate in technical planty terms because they are long and skinny like a lance or a spear. They also have very distinct veins. They also will have the very distinct fibers along the length of the stem. Two different plants can be used in pretty much exactly the same way. Will the narrow leaf t um, be t more tender generally than the broad leaf? Or does it still matter about the size of the plant overall? I can speak to that in principle. I don't see for narrow leaf plantain very often. And uh, in general, with harvesting any edible wild green, the smaller and younger the plant is, the more tender and the more succulent the leaf will be. I would imagine that applies to narrowleaf plantain in the same way that it does for broadleaf plantain. However, I have less personal experience with narrowleaf plantain just because it's not as common in the places that I forage. Mm -hmm. That's plantain. Great. Next up, we have mugwort. It's amazing. It's everywhere. It's super invasive. And it's food. It's also a plant that rides the line between food and medicine. The leaves of mugwort are very small, essentially, on younger plants and get much larger on mature plants and are food. You can eat them, they're edible, they're tasty. They have a weird bitter aftertaste that some people really enjoy, some people do not. And they are not necessarily a plant you want to eat a ton of because they can also have some amount of mental effects. Uh, these plants, if you dry them and make them into a tea, for some people will serve as a sedative and make you go to sleep. Some people will often experience weird enhanced uh, dreams when they have had mugwort tea before they go to sleep. Some people don't. I don't. You might not either, but you also might. Uh, this is a plant that is as much a food as it is a medicine and is somewhere in between. I don't personally eat large amounts of mugwort at once, but I will have you know, a small amount of them with a meal. Any plant can also uh, be something that you want to have in small amounts, especially if you're having it for the first time. There's poisonous plants and there's edible plants, but beyond that, there's human biology and it's weird and you might just be allergic to some plant for no particular reason. The last plant we talked about, plantain. Incredibly useful plant. I know many, many people who use it as food, who use it as medicine, and I know someone who is deathly allergic to it. When she is exposed to it in any amount, she has an anaphylactic level reaction and potentially could die. So whenever you're having a plant for the first time, try a little bit. Make sure that not only is it the right plant, but also that it is okay for you. Because everyone's body is different and everyone 
would have a bad effect from one plant that another person is totally fine with. And mugwort is somewhere on that line. For some people, it's totally fine as a foodstuff. For some people, they will very easily get weird dreams from it if they have too much. It grows prolifically everywhere and is a plant that you can easily harvest in mass without worrying about it. That said, most of the plants we talk about today are also very virulent and you can harvest them as much as you want and you won't make a damage to their population. And that doesn't apply to every plant. And it doesn't apply to every situation either. If you are deliberately cultivating dandelions, you don't want to harvest all of them because you'll kill off the population. If you are harvesting mugwort and it's a weed and you just want to get rid of all of it, then you get rid of all of it. You might as well eat it, but destroying the population is what you want. So with harvesting any plants, and especially plants for food because you're going to be harvesting a large quantity of them, it is important to remember the ecological impact in the future of whatever you do. Uh, some plants take many, many years to replace their populations. Uh, trout lily, a plant we won't talk about today because it, this is the wrong time of the year and the wrong environment for it, uh, is an adorable little plant, produces tiny lancelet leaves that are shiny with little white spots on them uh, that produce leaves only in the springtime but only flower and make new individuals every seven years. Seven years. So they are an example of a wild edible that is just delicious and wonderful, and that one needs to be very careful of the population while harvesting. Mugwort isn't one of those. Harvest as much as you want, it'll be fine. It can also look somewhat different than this. These are younger individuals, but once plant starts to get older, it'll look very different. When the plant gets older still and starts to go to flower, it will look yet different again as it develops flower clusters and at this point the closed flower clusters as it starts to go to seed and starts to die back. In any stage, it is recognizable because of the undersides of the leaves. The undersides are very starkly in contrast to the top. The top side of the leaf ranges anywhere from this kind of green, like a lighter yellowy green, to a very dark green, but the undersides are bright silver. And on some individuals there will almost be a like fine coating of silver hairs on them as well. Not always. Uh, they have a very distinct center line to their leaves, and then individual branchings coming off of that. There is also a lot of variation among mugwort leaves. These are mugwort leaves. I have also seen mugwort leaves where the individual sections were much thicker than this, or even thinner than this. It's a plant that between individuals can vary a lot in exactly how it looks, so you need to figure out what are the common traits to look for. The common traits are silvery underside and the growth pattern of leaves coming off the center stem. The leaves may even look even weirder if they're coming off where a flower stem is. It's a weird plant. Leaves can be used as food, they can be used as tea, but the roots, if you dig them up, can also be used as medicine. Uh, they have similar effects to the leaves, but are much more potent and much more concentrated, and will act as a fairly strong sedative and completely quick sleep sometimes, uh, among other actions as well. And I won't get into all of those today because it does a lot of different things. Yeah, that's my work. Hello again. Next, 
We have one of my absolute favorite plants. It is sweet, it's tasty, it's delicious. It tastes almost like lemon candy. It is wood sorrel. It has leaves that I will often find people misidentify as clover because they aren't actually clover leaves, but they are shaped like tiny hearts in the same way that clover leaves are. Clover leaves are also edible, so if you get it mixed up, you'll be fine. And these are going to taste very different than clover leaves. Clover leaves will taste green and planty. These will taste lemony and delicious. Uh, this is an easy plant to identify from the heart-shaped leaves alone, but also if you smell it or if you taste it, it will taste very strongly of lemons. And that's because it has a chemical in it called oxalic acid that gives it a strong tart lemony flavor and is actually the same chemical that's often used in certain kinds of candies to get that tart lemony flavor across. That said, oxalic acid ha has myriad biological effects, one of which is it actually inhibits your body's ability to absorb calcium. You have to eat a lot of it before that becomes a problem. But if you are eating nothing but sorrel salads every day for weeks on end, you might start to have problems. And that is an important thing to know with any plant because every plant will have some chemical in it that might do something weird to your body. So it's important to have a lot of different plants rather than just a lot of one specific kind of plant. That said, oxalic acid is easily inhibited by dairy products and it was actually traditionally used by the French to make a cream soup that is also delicious and would recommend trying. So um, this wood sorrel has the oxalic acid which makes it hard to absorb calcium but if you drink dairy products which are high in calcium it counteracts the effects of the oxalic acid. Is that what you said? No. <laughs> Close, but no. Um, the oxalic acid actually binds to uh, a particular component of the dairy product mm. so that your body can't absorb it and it will just pass through your system. I see. Uh, and that is why they were traditionally used together because somehow people figured that out even before the existence of modern science that you know these things work together in a good way. I yeah. love having visitors to the farm try this one because it takes a second for the strong lemony flavor to kick in. So, you know, they sort of are looking suspiciously at this weed that I'm trying to make them eat and then their their face will just sort of light up when they get to the lemon flavor because it's such a surprise and it's such a strong zing. Yeah. And even among people who have already had uh, any kind of sorrel, wood sorrel uh, or sheep sorrel, I enjoy showing people the seed pods because they are even more lemony mm. than the leaves are. The seed pods are these weird five-sided, <clears throat> almost okra looking things that if you break open have many tiny little seeds inside. They're bright white. Yeah, and they pop out too sometimes mm -hmm. once the pod is fully mature. Uh, and these seed pods and the seeds are even more uh, flavorful and lemony than the leaves are. Uh, this is a plant that any part of the above ground plant you can eat. You can eat the stems, you can eat the leaves, you can eat the seed pods, you can eat the flowers. It's all fair game and it's all going to be lemony and delicious and amazing. Does it work well if you try to make a lemon flavored <laughs> tea? I've never actually tried that. Mm. Something That's to experiment a good with. Good question. If you try that at home, let me know how it goes. I would think it would work. Yeah. But I don't know that for sure. All right. That's all yeah. we know about wood sorrel. <laughs> cool. That's wood sorrel. Cleavers. A plant that. And its name tells you how to identify it. This is a plant that is more easily identified by touch 
than it is by sight. Because if you run your hand along the length of it, it's grippy. It feels like the rough side of Velcro, along the underside of the leaves, along the stem, along the entire plant. Uh, when I look at it closely, I can see tons and tons of little micro spikes that aren't um, painful or sharp to the touch, but they do cling to the skin on my fingers. Cling, cleaving. <laughs> so can I eat this? You can. The stem is edible, the leaves are edible. You can eat any of the above ground parts of the plant and they are delicious and amazing and lightly sweet, which mm -hmm. is partly why I really enjoy them. And like I said, they are cleaving. They do stick to your skin. Chewing them is kind of a weird time. Uh, I will often cook these down first before eating them so that the cleave cleaving factor isn't as extreme. And you can totally eat them straight and it's a fun, weird challenge. The other thing I look for when identifying these, if we are going by how to identify visually, is their leaves all come out at the same point. They'll come out in a ring around the stem. Uh, these are called whirled leaves. They come out in a whirl all the way around. The other thing about cleavers that's distinctive is the stem is actually square. If you look at it carefully in cross-section, you can see there are four distinct sides, and the stem is actually squared off uh, in the same way that most that mints will have square stems. Uh, cleavers is not, in fact, a type of mint. Mints don't have whirled leaves, but it does share the square stem trait with them. That's Cleavers. Next plant is another incredibly common plant. This is Wild Carrot. It's also known as Queen's Ant Lace because the flower looks very delicate and lace-like. It comes out very flat on the top and has hundreds of individual little flowers peeking out through there. Oftentimes at the exact center, there will also be a small cluster of one to five flowers that are dark red as well, but not always. And they say that that little dot of red is the little dot of blood where Queen Anne pricked her finger while she was making her lace. I'm very excited to learn this because I'm very familiar with wild carrots as a small weed in the garden and as queen and place as a big beautiful flower in the garden but I had no idea they were the same species until this conversation. And that gets into the whole hot mess of common names because this plant is called wild well, carrot when it's small, sometimes when it's big. It's also called queen and lace when it's big. It has another common name that's less common that I don't remember right now. And if you go online to research plants, you will find that the same plant can have many different names. And to standardize that, there's the great system come up with by Carl Linnaeus of binomial nomenclature. Binomial two names, also known as the Latin names. Uh, there's a genus and a species assigned to everything, and that will be standardized. You can go to China and tell them that you're talking about Dacus carota, and they will know what you mean if they're a plant nerd who knows Latin names. Most people don't. It is the same name across the world. Mostly. As our understanding of plants and biology and genetics increases, things are constantly getting shifted around. Plants will sometimes be moved into a different genus or even a different family than they were originally placed in. Uh, families might be broken off into new subdivisions as scientists realize that the genetics and the morphology are actually more different than they thought. So Latin names can change, but they won't 
be nearly as inconsistent as common names. And there will always be at least one Latin name that is the most agreed upon Latin name currently. So as you are looking around in your research, make sure you have the right plan. Uh, yeah. So back to Queen Diane Lace. This plant is identifiable by the giant flower cluster. It's also identifiable because there is fine hairs along the stem. Uh, they say that the queen has hairy legs. It won't be as noticeable when the plant is at the phase of ground cover, when it is just the leaves, but there will still be a very fine coating of hairs usually. Sometimes you will find the plant just as a bunch of leaves growing out of ground level. It, if it has not developed a flower stalk yet, it will just be leaves. You can identify the leaves because they are very heavily divided and will have, coming off the center stalk, many more individual side leaves as well. Once you find this plant, it's a carrot. What do you think we're going to eat? The root! It looks like a carrot. It smells like a carrot. Very, very intensely smells like a carrot. Which is another great indicator for this plant because there are other plants that have similar looking flowers that are poisonous. Uh, one of the most poisonous plants in the world poison hemlock uh, looks vaguely similar to Queen's Anne's Lace. There are plenty of differences. It's very unlikely to get them mixed up. And it's a plant that can kill you, so it's worth knowing. Of all of the lookalikes for Queen Anne's Lace, wild carrot, none of the roots will smell like carrot except for wild carrot. If you take the root and wash the dirt off, maybe scrape off the outside layer of flesh. Uh, it is basically just a carrot, and you can use it in all the same ways that you would use carrots. However, it gets better. The seeds of Queen Anne's Lace, which after the flower completes its life cycle, will curl up into a little ball thing, which we have mainly right here, and will make thousands upon thousands of these little seeds that almost look like tiny hairy footballs up close. Oh, and there's a bug in there, cool. And these seeds can also be eaten and can be used as a cooking spice. They taste somewhat similar to caraway and can be used in all the ways that you would use caraway. When you cook with them, do you grind them up or do you just throw them in whole? I usually ground them up because I don't like the little hairy bits on the outside. Yeah. You can use them whole, I've tried it, mm -hmm. it's not my favorite thing, and I could definitely see some people liking it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is important to use plants in a way that you enjoy. I really enjoy bitter greens, I eat dandelions a lot, I eat plantain, plantain leaves a lot. I really enjoy like bitterness in my dishes. Not everyone does. If you don't enjoy that, maybe don't use those plants as much. Uh, food should not only be nourishing to your body, but it should also just make you happy. And that's Wild Carrot. Hello again. Here we have Dandelion. I can identify this one even. <laughs> so common even Kathy already knows what it means. <laughs> this is one of the most common plants that you will find uh, here, that you will find anywhere in any garden, in any cultivated space. Uh, it is incredibly fast spreading and will grow in almost any soil type, uh, in any environment type. I have seen them growing up through cracks in the pavement in cities. This plant is everywhere and you can eat it. That said, if you find it in the city, you might not want to eat it.
plants uh, inevitably absorb what is around them, and if they're growing in a very polluted environment, uh, they will end up being polluted too. They will end up absorbing whatever is in the asphalt that they're growing in, around. So with dandelions and with any plant, you want to make sure that you're harvesting from somewhere where it's not going to have outside things in it. If people are spraying pesticides or herbicides on the dandelions on their lawn, you don't want to eat those. If it's growing somewhere in an area where it's next to a major road and is going to have exhaust and car junk getting into it, you don't want to eat those because those will eventually end up in your body if you eat the plant. That's exactly why we grow in these raised beds here at Reservoir Farm because this whole area used to be a parking lot. So there's still bits of asphalt under the ground um, and there may or may not be lead pipes. So to be on the safe side, we, we bring in clean dirt, soil, and we put it in raised beds so there's a separation between the polluted ground and the soil that we grow in. which is a good way to solve the problem. Uh, so, dandelion. How do I know this is a dandelion? Actually, let's start with Ethan. How do you know this is a dandelion? Yeah, so for me, the clearest signal is this yellow flower that I'm gonna pick right now to hold up. Um, this is a dandelion. I've been able to identify this since I was a little kid. Mm. Because they're so common, I'm also familiar with their leaves that are sort of broad and jagged. And maybe you can show me how you identify them. Yeah. Nice. So, disclaimer, I'm a plant nerd. I know way too many things about plants. So, I find interesting how other people identify plants. Mm -hmm. So, when I look at this plant, I'm looking at a few things. I'm looking at the yellow flower. I'm looking at the structure of the flower that has many individual yellow petals, that has, if you go all the way to the center of the flower, many individual uh, stamens, uh, a certain part of the plant that provides the male sperm to fertilize the flower. Uh, I see many of those in the center, and once it's broken, I'm seeing milky white sap. And this is really uh, an important cue on dandelions. There are some plants that look somewhat similar to dandelion. None of them are super common, but they can be around none of them have this white milky sap. This is a, uh, this is the plant's blood that has a compound that's similar to latex in it. And it's very bitter and it's very, it's not a good time. I don't recommend eating it. If you want just a personal challenge, you can break off a larger stem and just suck all of the bitter fluid out of it. Sort of like the it's cinnamon challenge? cinnamon challenge. I don't even know what that is. Apparently it's very hard to swallow a teaspoon of cinnamon because it really coats your throat and is much too strong to be eaten like that. <laughs> that sounds unpleasant. Yeah, like that. Similar to drinking dandelion uh, inside. <laughs> drinking dandelion juice. <laughs> the other thing that makes it easier to drink is the stem is hollow. So there is a rim of plant material but the inside is actually just a hollow tube of air. And that is also unique to dandelion that the little legs do not have. Looking at the leaves, I'm looking at a few different things. I'm looking at the reddishness towards the base of the leaf. I'm looking at the fact that it's jaggedy and toothed. And the fact that those tooths are facing back towards the bottom of the leaf. Some of the dandelion look like will have the teeth facing either directly outwards or away from the base of the leaf. Only dandelion has them going down. Uh, dandelion leaves are delicious. They can be used like any cooking green. They are more bitter than cultivated plants, but if you balance that out in the flavor profile of whatever you're cooking, it comes out just fine. We aren't going to get directly get into it, but the root of dandelion is also ingestible and uh, can be used for food, though I wouldn't use it in large doses. Uh, it is more commonly used as a medicinal herb 
because it helps cleanse the liver. Uh, it's a plant that cleanses the liver. Insert big fancy word, whatever that is that I'm blanking on right now. Uh, you can dig it up. Uh, it's a long taproot that grows straight into the ground, so it does take some doing to get it up. And you can brew it into tea. You can uh, dry it and grind it up. And I have been told it tastes similar to coffee. I don't find it that similar, but you might enjoy it. Uh, and it is delicious and nourishing, and it tastes rich and like food. Let's see, where did our flower go? Our flower. Flour is also edible. Uh, you can use it in salads, you can use it in uh, stir fries as a vegetable. There's a traditional French soup that is made exclusively from dandelion flowers that is delicious, would recommend. And you can also just eat them straight. They're delicious. Dandelions are often the enemy of uh, lawn caregivers. Um, they are most often mowed down, which is unfortunate because in addition to all of their edible properties, they are also a huge attractor of pollinators and bees. So they are really a great thing to have in any garden or wild or lawn space. Thank you so much for watching this today. I hope that you've learned something. I hope you had fun. I hope that this inspires you to go out into the world with a new eyes to see things. It is very easy now to see what is sometimes called the wall of green. And for those of us who might not know plants very well, it's easy to look out and see, eh, there's green things there. Why should I care? And yet, knowing the plants and knowing what grows in your place and knowing how you can use them and how they are part of the ecosystem can uh, really, has for me at least, might for you, completely change the way that I experience the world and I see the world around me and see my place in it. I'd also like to say thank you to you for showing up. Thank you to Kathy for being awesome and being my co-host here, to Maggie behind the camera for being awesome and filming, and also thank you to all of the plants that we have harvested today, uh, who, some of whom we have killed. Uh, thank you to all of the people who tend this land and make this the beautiful garden space that it is, as well as all the people before now, the uh, people who have lived in Bridgeport for hundreds of years now, the people before anyone from Europe arrived, uh, the Pagusset, the Wappingers, and the other native tribes of this area who tended this land long, long ago. And to you, because you're the next tender of the land. And I hope that as you go out into the world and enjoy these new delicious edible plants that you've learned, that you also remember that there are people coming later and that you can make this place a more healthy, happy, uh, rich, and vibrant ecosystem for the future generations to come. I learned a lot today. I could only, before this um, filming, I could only identify a handful of the things we went over today. And that's really exciting because I know that now that I know the names and I know the look and I know the uses of those plants, I'm going to start seeing them everywhere around me. Because that's how it is for the other things that you learn what, where their place is and how they grow. So I'm excited to be able to share this going forward and see for myself all of the other useful things growing in this space. Because weeds to a farmer can be very overwhelming and cause me to be kind of grumpy sometimes. But uh, every time I learn of a new useful weed, a new edible weed, it uh, makes the whole thing more exciting and fun. And thank you for sharing that with us today. I appreciate your use of the term weed. Because I used to also think of some plants as weeds. I don't want that there, that's just a thing that's a problem for me. Yeah. But I ultimately, now, knowing as many plants as I do, look at every plant and think, Oh hi, nice to see you here. Yeah, they're just wild You're a plant. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
they are all here growing, they're all doing their thing, and we can benefit from them just like they can benefit from us. Thank you so much for being here today, and I hope to see you out in the woods foraging sometime soon.